We come this morning to Nehemiah chapter 8, 1 to 9, reading the law part 1. I've called this reading the law part 1 because this particular chapter really shows Jewish thought patterns. Jewish people think in rounds, not in a, just a, a straight line to the end. And he says some things in the first part of our message. He's going to say again in the second part of our message. And also, in dealing with this, he doesn't deal with it as a, a, a time clock and tell you on, on a particular day this happened, and then on this day it's happened. He does give you the day, one day in that whole passage, that that was a day they, they really got set up and going to read the law. But in introduction to this, he talks about... And today we're going to be only in verse 1 and verse 2 about the prepared people and the preparation of Ezra. Nehemiah chapter 8, 1 and 2. For all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the, the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding, that means children, upon the first day of the seventh month. The people were, pre were prepared in two ways in purpose and location. The people asked for the word of God. What didn't the people ask for? They did not ask for a political commentary. Many churches today give political commentary. But the people what they asked for was the word of God. They didn't ask for social justice. Well, we can tell by the way things are going between the, the virus and the protests and the riots. Politics and justice seem to be leading the, the parade these days. There was also another thing they didn't ask for. They didn't ask for emotional reassurance. What they wanted was the bare facts of what God had said in His Word. They also had a, a location that they all gathered in and you would think that possibly they would gather up here near the temple but there wasn't enough room up by the temple so they gathered down by the water gate in this area here because you could set up and they had a wide vast area where all the people the men and women and children could all gather You see this as I brought this up a little bit more to, to show you the area that they, this is where they all gathered. And the first time they gathered, they asked Ezra to read the law of Moses. But that's not the day that it happened. We'll see that as we go on. Well, why did the law need to be read? There was only one set of scrolls. The printing press was not invented until 1440 in Germany by Johann Gutenberg. So if you're, if you're going to actually get your hand on a copy of the Word of God, I guess why it's still in the Bible. You had, you had to go where, where the, the priests and the scribes were because they had 
But for another reason, the ability to read was a luxury, not a common practice. There were no newspapers being distributed in that day because there was no printing press to print the, 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 the newspapers. Everything had to come by word of mouth, including for the people, the reading of the law. The only way they were going to, going to grasp this was if somebody came and had scrolls, which is kind of interesting because the law of Moses is from Genesis to Deuteronomy. It was made up of five different scrolls. And every time that anybody wanted to, to write about these things, they had to take and have a scribe to write it down and make a copy of it. How long would it take you to make one copy of the Gospel of John by hand? Just the Gospel of John that does for God so loved the world. Get that message over there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him. Without Him, there was not anything created that was created. How long would it take you to write that all down? I know today that most people have at least a half dozen Bibles in their home. I have over a half dozen myself. All the same imprint that has been used and wore out over the years. I didn't have to write down any of them. It was already written down for me. All I had to do was go to the store and shut off a little bit of money and could get a buy a copy. In fact, the Bible for many years was the best selling book in the entire world. But not when it was just the Torah. How about the preparation of Ezra? He was a priest, which means he was from the tribe of Levi. But he was also a scribe. <coughs> he not only wrote the Torah down, he also wrote things to talk to the people about. He also wrote the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. We think we're busy sometimes if we have to really spend an extra 10 minutes doing something. How many 10 minute periods of time would it take if you wrote the book of Romans? Just the book of Romans. The just shall live by faith. If you had to write that down, but what if you couldn't read it? You had to find somebody who could read. And find someone who was able to teach you what was there. Well, we've had pastors, missionaries, evangelists, all doing these things all of our lives. We don't know what it would be like to not be able to read and not have a, a copy of the Bible to lay on our, on our coffee table with dust off once a week. These people knew what they needed. They didn't need another TV show, another web page to go to, another Facebook or Twitter or whatever other ones are out there, or so many of them are out there today, to, to take up their time. What they really desired more than anything else, amidst all the problems and, and, and tribulations and problems they had, was they needed and they wanted the Word of God. And they needed a priest and a scribe and a teacher of the law to do that. Before the captivity, I found an interesting verse which... Uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked. That's one thing I have to say doing these things uh, at home. I didn't get too sidetracked. I didn't have an audience. I had, uh, Louise is recording it behind me. And 
there was nobody in front of me and I, I, I couldn't read faces and says, what, what are you thinking, right? <laughs> but back in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, 9, it says this. And they taught, that being the, the priests and the scribes, they taught in Judea, or Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. In other words, the priests carried these heavy book scrolls with them and went about through all the cities of Judah and taught the people. During the days of the Wesley brothers, they were known as circuit riders. During the, and during the day of Billy Graham, they were known as the evangelists. During the, the last few years, they're known as in-home Bible study. Isn't it interesting that the same thing is going on that has gone on for centuries? Taking the Word of God to those who did not have it and reading it to them, teaching it to them, Well, how did the priests find out what to do? Remember, they were born into the tribe of priests. And their mommies and daddies, they, they taught them person to person as they were younger. And as they, they started to grow in the Lord, they also made available what called a commentary teaching proper exegesis. We'll get into that in a minute. What's the proper way to understand the Word of God? It's not to pick and choose the verse you like and ignore everything else. It's to put things in context. When the plain truth of the Scripture makes sense, seek no other sense than the common sense of the that's written there. Standard, traditional law of exegesis. Let the Bible speak for itself. You'd be surprised what it says. You'll also be surprised what it doesn't say. Because you see, a lot of people say, well, the Bible says someplace, it says this. No, it's not in there. Now you really read it and get to it. Critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially the scripture. Now we are going to be here in just a little bit. And I, I feel the need to, to teach you some things because you're Gentiles, not Jews. Okay? You know the difference between the Torah, the Talmud, and the Midrash? These are the, all the scrolls they had. The, the Torah was the law of Moses, which we already looked at being from Genesis through Deuteronomy. In other words, when they started their study of the book of Torah, the, the, the scrolls of Torah, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They had a foundation to start with. It was not evolution. It was God created. We're going to deal with this more next week, so let me just stop there before I preach next week's sermon. The Talmud was a bunch of scrolls that uh, elaborated on the laws contained in the Torah. For example, thou shalt not steal. Well, they had some rules for not stealing. Thou shalt not covet. There was rules and elaboration of what that meant. This was the Talmud. You could call it an early commentary. But it was not as much as a commentary because commentary is what some person thought about. An elaboration, it was still what God thought about the law he's written. And using these priests, they, they elaborated on the contents of the Torah. 
not adding their own views into it. The Midrash, that's different. It's sad to say many rabbis today teach Midrash and not Torah. The same thing as many ministers in the pulpit today are teaching their views, their interpretation of what God said rather than what God said himself. But I want to deal with the Midrash because it's important as well. Midrash is defined by the Wikipedia in Wikipedia. It is biblical exegesis by ancient Judaic authorities, using a mode of interpretation prominent in the Talmud. You know how to tie it together here? The word itself means textual interpretation or study. If you're going to study the law, you need a teacher to teach you. Faith coming by hearing, hearing coming come by the word of God. And how shall they hear if we're not sent? Same principle today as was true back in the book of Chronicles. <coughs> Jacob Newsner said this is a rabbinical tradition in the article that he wrote in what is Midrash. Rabbat, rabbinical tradition teaches that Ezra himself was not a high priest. I have read several commentaries that said he was the same as a high priest. No, he wasn't. As you go all the way back to the Midrash, you will find out by looking at the Midrash who related to the Talmud, who related back to the Torah, that only God spoke the word of God. Notice that Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7 list all those exiles who re returned to Jerusalem with the Rome. Ezra's name is conspicuously absent from this list because he only returned to Jerusalem later in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. When the people first went back, Ezra did not go back then. Well, you see there's two types of the midrash. There's that which deals with the, the law of Moses, called the midrash philosophy. And the other has to do with biblical narrative. When you, when you talk, about the historical books or the Psalms, you're doing Midrash about it, but you're doing Midrash Agadah. If you're talking about the law, there's a new res a respect for the law. If you're talking about the other books, even though they're inspired, and we recognize that, they still treat them differently in their interpretation of them. One of the books of Midrash, Song of Songs, that is. chapter 4, verse 2. Right? Kind of like, now, they have, what they have done in the later years, they've broken this down by chapter and verse the same as the Bible. Same as you read some commentaries, they broke it down too, showing you where they, where they break things down. But in the Midrash here now, Song of Songs, that is, says this. The temple was actually consecrated because Ezra did not arrive at the time. The temple had gotten built up there in the northern part of the, where the wall was built. And they already consecrated that. And because of that, there was no room around the temple for people to really gather except to come and bring their sacrifices. When he goes on, it says that Satan would have filed false, or filed accusations against the Jews. Our good Ezra would better serve the high priest than the current high priest, Joshua ben Jehovah. This is because even though Joshua ben Jehovah would have been high priest, Ezra was more righteous than he. 
Can you imagine Satan accusing the high priest of being unrighteous? If Ezra had taken that role of high priest, it could have been a revolution. <laughs> Matthew Henry, several centuries later, had some comments on Ezra. He said this, God gave him ability and authority, and then the people gave him opportunity and invitation. Who invited Ezra to come and, and read the law to them? The people. Knowledge is spiritual arm, which those who are able should give to everyone that needs, to everyone that asks. Do you know any verse of scripture that somebody else doesn't know? You have an obligation to give a spiritual alms to that person because they need it or an and because they ask. Matthew continues his commentary on ministers at large. The book of the law is not to be confined to the scribe's study. Dear ones, it's not ours to have and them to try to get. <laughs> but to be brought before the congregation and read to them in their own language. You know what's interesting is language changes over the years. And language also changes by dialect and by language. Spanish people cannot read our English translation, as many as there are. They need it in Spanish. The Japanese people need it in Japanese. The Chinese need it in Chinese. The Navajo need it in Navajo. The Arapaho need it in Arapaho. The Hopi need it in Hopi. Well, that's what it's doing in our country. I've heard a term here lately that I, I start to understand a little bit. We're privileged, not because we're white, but because we have so many different translations that we can read. We're privileged to say we like this one better than that one. That's a privilege that many people throughout the world don't have. In fact, biblical translators are still trying to translate every year at least 15 to 20 new languages so people can have it in their own language. Matthew Henry also talked to the minister in particular. Ministers, when they go to the pulpit, should take their Bibles with them. Ezra did so. Hence, they must, they must fetch their knowledge according to that rule. They must speak and must show that they do speak. What does the Bible say? Tell me the old, old story. Write in my heart every word. What are people needing? What are people asking for? What does the Bible say? I have to tell you that over the last two or three months we have not been gathering together. That is the question I got more on the telephone than any other. What does the Bible say about this virus? Well, verse 2 says that when they finally got things put together, it was on the seventh month 
on the first day of the month. That's what it says in verse 2. Back in Numbers, the first day of the seventh month became a very important day. You shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no civil work. It is a day of blowing of trumpets unto you. The Feast of Trumpets, also known by the month there. Now, I didn't do this before with this verse. I never caught it before, but it could be translated from Navajo, but these are both ways Hebrews translate this word. Teshonet, that could be Hebrew. That could be Navajo, right? Ashenet, anything else? Ne, one of the words that they can use a lot. Or it can be pronounced Tishanah. But that was the seventh month. It was also the first day of Rosh Hashanah. How many have ever heard of Rosh Hashanah? Good. We won't have to go into details for the next nation of what it means. Other than it's the Jewish New Year. It's a fall holiday taking place at the beginning of the month of Tishan, which is actually the seventh month of the Jewish year, counting from Nisan as the spring. The spring. Hello, Gentiles. Does it make sense to you that the seventh month should be the first month? <laughs> I'm sorry you're not Jewish and understand that. Because the first month, the seventh month, the seventh month is the first month. It's both a time of rejoicing and serious introspection. A time to celebrate the completion of another year while also taking stock of one's life. Let's get back to Nehemiah chapter 8 now. And remember that the desire came from the people for the law. It was not from the priest. I think this is important to note that it was the people who asked for what, did, what has God said. It wasn't the clergy of the day, the priests and the scribes. They were too busy making political comments, social, looking for social justice and emotional reassurance to get what did, it, what did God say. The law came from God Delivered by Ezra, backed by 12 priests. We're going to see this in part two. That six people staying on each side of it. But the law, what did God say? Not Ezra, what's your opinion? What does the law of Moses say? They represented me. 12 tribes, and the 12 tribes did not come back out of that captivity on two and a half feet. But when you get to near the end of the Torah, there is a promise to Israel in Deuteronomy 1.10. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou shalt seek him with all thy heart, with all thy soul. Ever hear that before without reading the book of Deuteronomy? That was for Israel. But you see, Jesus also gave a promise to the church. In Luke 11, verse 9, I say unto you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, you will find. Knock. It'll be opened unto you. You want to know what's happening? Ask the Lord. Seek in the Word of God. Knock on the very door of heaven. It'll be opened unto you. Paul gave an interesting reason to seek the Lord. And his message there, and Morris Hill, he, 
he's talking about the Jewish people, he says they, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him. Our feelings should get involved in seeking God. Oh, I know we like to be stoic. I mean, you know, anybody that shows any feelings, something's wrong with them, they need a psychiatrist these days. But there ought to be feelings. When's the last time your feelings got involved with how far apart you have gotten and I have gotten from God? How, as the song says, how long has it been since we talked with the Lord and told Him our hearts hidden secrets? How long, how long has it been? Our feelings should get involved. And when we, when we allow our feelings to get involved, we find them. Though, not far from every one of us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, I got kicked out of a, of a church, by the way, for preaching the next verse. For in Him, we live and move and have our being. They kicked me out of that church. They were too busy involved with their, their lives to think about that it's in Him that we live, that we move, we have our being. As certain also, as our poets have said, we are also His offspring. We're born again, which means we're in Him, we live in Him, we move in Him, have our being in Him, and they said, you're going to want to hear Still one of my favorite verses. It's tied to all that to Gospel of John, the Book of Romans, and every other letter that the apostles wrote, including the Book of Revelation. I'll never forget, I was still a missionary in Philadelphia, and a Jewish man accepted the Lord, and he had no place to stay, he got kicked out, and a couple of guys I knew who were students at Philadelphia College of Bible invited them to come and stay at, at, at their, in their dorm. This guy's name was Jerry. So you tell you a few things about Jerry. He was one of those protesters out there that protested the battleship in New Jersey. New, New Jersey. He had all kinds of things going on in, in that protest area. He picked up the book of Revelation and he started reading it. The more he read the happier he got. And the two roommates woke up and said, Jerry, what's going on? Go back to sleep. You'll never understand. God and I are having a private conversation. You know what? We need that private conversation because we are his offspring. And it's in him we live and we move and we have our being. We need to remind ourselves of that moment by moment, not just week by week or day by day. In fact, David's determination because of that very fact is this. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He memorized passages that he heard from the scribes and from the priests. Remember, David did not have a printing press either. When's the last time you memorized one verse out of the Bible? Even if it was John 11, 35. I'll give you an easy one. Remember what that one says? Jesus saved. Hmm? Jesus saved. No, nope, Jesus was. <laughs> you know how I became interested in the Bible? Commercials on television. I already graduated from Bible school, but I had not really spent time reading it for myself. And every time a commercial came out, I'd take that New Testament out and I'd start reading it. And it wasn't very long before the program was over and I was still reading. 
Win the last time. You know the most important point of the message. last time since you have such access to so many different versions of the Bible that you took and even compared version to version and read and memorized that we might not sin against you.